Now, it is my pleasure to introduce this session, Research and Drug Development Updates. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, I'm able to hand this over uh, to uh, Dr. Gonoransky. Dr. Gonoransky is the Program Director for the Neuro Neuromuscular Fellowship of the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, has joined us uh, numerous times today already and been a, a great asset to this entire weekend in the forum. We thank him for that. And uh, we are going to meet some uh, researchers in the next uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, also allowing some time for questions as well. And these will be moderated uh, by Dr. Gonoransky and I will turn things over to him now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, everybody, for the invitation. I have the pleasure, we'll have a great speakers today, so we're here, I'm going to hear a lot about new updates on research and uh, therapies uh, around uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The first speaker, I have the great pleasure to introduce him, which is uh, Ronald Kahn. Uh, he's the CEO at Sick Kids, but beside that, I have the pleasure to um, learn from him when he was actually doing the Neuromuscular Clinic with Dr. Dowling here. And while I was a fellowship, I doing the fellowship here, um, and I, I learned a lot from him. So, uh, Ronnie, um, welcome. Uh, and all yours. Thank you, Hernan, for the kind introduction. And just to let everybody know, there was a time where I could maybe teach him something, but but these times are over. He is now one of our huge assets at Sick Kids. So thank you for the invitation. Let me try to share my screen. Um, can you see this? Hernan? That's good. Great. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to spend now maybe 10, 15 minutes to give you a bit of an overview of what we are doing in our own laboratory and also just a little bit what's happening around genome editing uh, for DMD. And then hopefully we'll actually uh, want to really spend some time answering your questions. So for anyone who is on the call who hasn't really heard about CRISPR yet, it is really a phenomenal technology that allows us to pretty much anywhere in the genome take what we <clears throat> call the genomic scissors really, identify a very, very small portion of a gene that is abnormal in the case of Duchenne, either deletion, either point mutation or duplication, which we'll talk about in a minute, and make a cut and try to see how you can repair uh, certain abnormalities in a gene. And what, what works for, for the dystrophin gene really works for every other gene in theory. And we'll talk about it at the end <clears throat> of our talk. So how can we use this wonderful technology to develop and think about therapeutic uh, options for Duchenne muscular dystrophy? As you all know, the absence of dystrophin, at the lower part here, right here, leads to um, destabilization of the membrane of the muscle where muscle cells have a higher chance of um, <clears throat> pretty much getting destructed. And then you enter the cycles of degeneration and regeneration, which for a long time, for the first few years in Duchenne boys works quite well. And then over time, as the regeneration becomes weaker and weaker, muscle cells, instead of being replaced by muscle cells, are being replaced by either fat or scar tissue. And that's usually the more that happens, the higher the risk is that you lose your ambulation and your ability to walk. So when you look at uh, the different genetic abnormalities in the dystrophin gene, you can really see that most of the abnormalities are either deletions, where you are missing a whole chunk of the dystrophin gene. Then there's about 20% where you just have one single change in the dystrophin gene. And then there are 10% duplications, which is something my lab focuses on. But we will, before we talk about this, there have now been a number of studies that have shown that using the CRISPR technology, you can pretty much induce what we call a permanent exon skipping. And what does that really mean? 
So if you look here on the left side, right here, here you have a deletion um, <clears throat> where you are interrupting what we call the reading frame, because you can see right here that this box over here doesn't really fit in here because you're missing the exon 50 here. Or on this side, you see uh, a point mutation. Both of those <clears throat> are leading to uh, the absence of dystrophin. So what can you do with CRISPR? You can use scissors and you have to use two different scissors. So each color is one scissor. So you have a green scissor here and a blue scissor here. And you can cut out either this entire exon, which is 51, or you can cut out a small piece of this point mutation. And as you do this, you are then creating what we call a shorter dystrophin right here. You see that the boxes are now fitting together because they're both smooth on this side, as well as here. And with that, you have a shorter dystrophin but it is a function of the strophin and has been shown to be beneficial in a lot of these studies I showed you earlier. And some of those have now been done in large animal models, either in a pig model uh, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy or in the uh, dog model that most of you probably have heard about. So it is for sure a very promising approach. And there is at least one company and now there's a second one coming on board thinking about it, who is trying to now take these studies that you see right here into a more conceptual study of trying to bring this into a human clinical trial. Now, as I mentioned to you before, there are 10% of patients who have duplications, anything like 10 and 12%. And this is really what we are focusing in my own laboratory on. And um, <clears throat> Before we were starting this entire work, we had to think about uh, how we're gonna test what we were testing in cells of Duchenne patients in, in a living biological model, meaning usually a mouse model. And while you probably have all heard about the MDX mouse, which um, <clears throat> is a mouse model for dystrophin deficiency, there is not any model really that was a good model for duplication studies. So the first thing we had to do is we had to actually create a duplication model. And you see here, it's the exon 18 to 30, which we duplicated in a mouse. And then we wanted to use the CRISPR genomic scissor approach to pretty much cut out this piece. So you have one single uh, exon 18 to 30 rather than the duplicated version. And so the advantage of this is, <clears throat> as opposed to what you have seen before, that you can use only one scissor. What do I mean by this? As you can see, we have two blue scissors right here who are cutting at a point within exon 18 to 30, which since it's duplicated, is the exact same genomic sequence. So rather than using a blue and a green scissor, so two different ones, which is important as we talk about side effects later on, we were able to use just one, which A, reduces the side effects, and at the same time um, also allows you to easier package this into kind of any delivery vehicle, and you end up with a corrected version of the dystrophin gene. On top of this, the biggest difference between this approach and the approach for the deletions and the point mutations is that we are actually restoring the entire full length gene, then producing the full length dystrophin protein. And this is really the first time that anyone has really tried to use a therapeutic genetic modification that doesn't lead to a shorter, still functional dystrophin, don't get me wrong, it's wonderful. But this approach really looks at the full restoration of the wild-type full-length dystrophin gene. So what we then did is we, we took these genetic scissors, which had 
the exact same sequence that we needed to cut out this duplication that I showed you earlier. Then we package this into an AV, which is currently the most common used vector for any kind of gene therapeutic um, pathways for muscle diseases. They, we'll talk about this in a minute. There are lots of other developments happening, but as of now, AV9, there's also AV8 and a slightly modified, modified version, but these are the ones that we are currently using. We injected this then into uh, newborn mice through the vein. So you use this here, right here, is a big vein of a newborn mouse, so you can get systemic expression. And then we waited for seven weeks and we're hoping that this was uh, a beneficial uh, effect on the mouse. And this is exactly what we saw. So here you see a wild type mouse, all the red uh, circles represent normal full length, full length dystrophin expression. And the pink uh, circles below just show you the histological normal way how we look at a muscle under the microscope. When you look at the untreated duplication mouse, you see, as you expect, no dystrophin, and you see a lot of these kind of abnormalities. So all these dark cells are inflammatory cells. And then all the lighter pink areas right here uh, is actually what we call fibrosis, like scar tissue formation. And when we looked at seven weeks after injection, you can see there's a lot of dystrophin fibers coming back. Although I think it's important, uh, apologies, it's important to note that some fibers look like almost expressing all of dystrophin. And then here you have some fainter fibers, which still express dystrophin, but not so much as here and here. But if you look at the histology under the microscope, the muscle looked much better. And the next thing we did is we wanted to see in a living mouse whether this would have any beneficial impact on the actual function of the muscle. So you can see here on this side, <clears throat> a little machine, like a little box where you can put mice in and then you measure through a camera, a lot of different activities. So one of the things we looked at right here is how much distance would these mice walk? And you can see there's a huge difference between a normal mouse and the deletion and the duplication mouse that is untreated. And then when you treat these mice, you see that they are almost walking the same distance as a wild type mouse, like a normal mouse. And we also looked at the ability um, of mice to stand up vertically. So <laughs> I will ass I assume that most of you have never really watched mouse, mice in a cage unless you have one at home as a pet. What mice do is they constantly throughout the day go up and down at the walls of a cage or so. So that's the what we call the vertical activity. And you can see that when you have a muscular dystrophy mouse right here, uh, that they do almost none of these activities. And when you then uh, have the treated mouse with the CRISPR-Cas9, you see quite a bit of improvement. So that's really uh, all what we uh, wanted to see. And we were quite excited about it. This is now published, was this year actually published in a, in a <clears throat> journal. And I'll tell you in a minute, uh, what we are now trying to do, because now you have, we did a fa fairly comprehensive study the only study that we are currently still finishing is, remember when I showed you the first picture, it was really a mouse that was a newborn mouse, which doesn't really translate into human reality, right? When your boys were diagnosed, they usually are diagnosed at the age of two, three, four, sometimes five, six years of age. So when you already have a little bit more advanced progression of the disease. So we are now treating a number of mice at the age of two months, four months, six months, eight months to see how much of what is already happening in terms of abnormal muscle in the mouse is can either be stabilized or can be reversed. So these are the studies that we are currently trying to finish up. And then there's another uh, just concept that I would like to introduce to you. Uh, because it was supported also by Jesse's journey, which is a really another clever idea from somebody in my laboratory. 
You remember when I showed you the picture of the treated uh, dystrophin staining where some of the uh, muscle cells were really very bright and looked like having a lot uh, uh, of dystrophin, but then there were other fibers which didn't quite have as much. So what we are trying to do now is we are trying to use the CRISPR-Cas system without actually making a cut in, or cutting somewhere in the gene. So there's a dual approach that you can use with this fantastic technology. And when you pretty much inactivate the genetic scissors, you can use, and you see this over here, you can use the guide without the scissors to promote what we call an expression of a gene. And what we are doing here now is, so we are using the technology that I showed you before to remove the duplication. And then we are trying to introduce this guide without, without the scissor to enhance the expression of the corrected dystrophin fibers. So <clears throat> it's a dual approach. It sounds, I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but really what we're trying to do is, we're trying to first fix the duplication and then anywhere where dystrophin levels are not as high as they should be, we're trying to push the expression so that the end result of this, and I don't have the data yet to show you, but the end result of this is hopefully that all of the fibers look as bright and red as most of the ones I showed you before. So what are the next steps and how can we bring this finally into the clinic? A couple of things <coughs> we need to think about. One is called the off-target effect. So while this is an incredibly precise technology, every time you use one of these scissors, whether it's one, two, or three, or four, each of these scissors comes with a so-called theoretical side effect, meaning although it's supposed to only cut at a very specific <coughs> area in the genome, there is always a small risk that it may cut somewhere else. So you have to <coughs> go through a lot of pre-studies, pre-clinical studies, to try to make sure that these are really as safe as possible. We are now, I think, landing at a point where we're most likely the standard that has to be used is that you take a cell of a patient, you correct that cell of the patient, and then you perform what we call whole genome sequencing on these corrected cells to make sure that really only where you want to make the cut in the genome, the cut occurs and not somewhere else in a gene that might potentially be harmful. The other issue is delivery vectors. So obviously I assume you have heard or you will hear about some of these exciting gene therapy trials, the gene therapy 1.0, how I call it, where you deliver a microdystrophin into the muscle cells and they're using AV vectors. At the moment, once, you have, once your body has been exposed to an AV vector, you cannot re inject with another AV vector because your body builds up immunity. I think that in within the next one to three or one to four years, we'll be able to do one of two things. The most likely short-term solution is that we will identify immunosuppressive agents. There are lots of them that we use for lots of different other diseases that you can suppress the immune system so you can re-inject another AV9, whether that is for a regular gene therapy, or in theory, one could think about doing gene therapy now, continue to develop the genome editing, and then re-inject the genome editing on top of the gene therapy. That is a few years out, but that's conceptually what many of us are thinking about in the field. Or we are thinking about different delivery vectors, which have nothing to do with AV9 or our adeno-associated viruses, where the immunogenic response is going to be very different. I think you will see this happening within the next few years, so that the issue of reinjection will hopefully be not as big of an issue as it is right now. And then you have, <clears throat> obviously, the risk of this scissor, the Cas9, which is the scissor, is a protein. 
Uh, every time you expose the body to a protein that the body doesn't know, there is a risk of an immune reaction from there. I will tell you that none of the studies in the larger animals, like the pig, the dog, or the mouse, have shown any uh, immune reactions. Whether that 100% translates into humans, I'm not entirely sure, but I think um, it's probably something we have to be less concerned about than, than I initially thought. And then that's the biggest question, the therapeutic window. Why am I saying this? I think as a general medical field where genome editing and gene therapies are about to become standard of care within the next anything between five to 15 years probably, the single biggest question that we will always have to ask is how late or how early does one have to start therapy? So for the Duchenne boys, would we have to start within the first few years to get the maximal benefit? That's what we think is the case, but actually nobody knows this because a lot of these studies, even the clinical trial studies, are usually just done in the younger population. So <clears throat> we need the research over the next few years to do gene therapy trials, other drug trials for Duchenne in boys that are 15 years and 20 and older. While we assume that maybe the older you get, the less beneficial the therapy is going to be, it may still, it may still help to halt progression. And I can tell you, and I'm going to end with this, maybe one of the most illuminating experiences I had as a physician was a dinner that I had several years ago in London, UK, at a Duchenne conference with uh, 12 young Duchenne men who uh, we were discussing <clears throat> some of these therapies. And the one comment that was made by three individuals uh, almost around the same time was, any kind of therapy that could at least preserve my state the way how I am right now is a good therapy. So I think as a field, we are always thinking about it needs to be a home run. And, and, and I think that's the wrong way to look at it. But we need our pharmaceutical companies to work with us and being willing to try some of these therapies, whether it's gene therapy or other drugs, also in older children, because they, we need to learn from humans. The time where we learn from mice and dogs is pretty much maximized out. And we now have to, if it's safe, learn from humans. So here you have the wonderful group of people who are actually doing all this work. I want to show you. So this is Elle, who did all the work on the duplication. <clears throat> and I'm trying to find the young student who is now doing the other work I'm showing. He is not on this picture here. I don't see him. Anyway, I'm going to stop now here. Um, thank you for listening. And I hope you're going to ask me a few questions. Thank you so much, Ronnie. It's such an incredible talk as always. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, so I guess I'll start with mine and then we'll go see uh, if anybody else has any questions on it that you can actually put on the chat. And I, I think that you can also raise your hand eventually. So uh, you talk about the AAV9, so the viral infection. I just want to know the, so what's the infection rate? So when we actually talk in how much muscle fibers are the virus are actually infected? like in the in terms of percentage and eventually also cardiac muscle. Have you seen what's the infection rate on, heart, on the heart or have you actually looked into the heart to see if there is restoration? Yeah, so we, we actually almost get more restoration in the heart. I haven't shown you the slides of this than in muscle. These, the, the actual quantification of dystrophin expression in muscle is a much more complicated um, <clears throat> procedure than, you, than, it is, than it seems. When you look at these pictures, uh, you feel like, well, we, this looks like you had 80% expression, but you actually have to take lots of different muscles from lots of different areas and then cumulatively get your results together. So we estimate 
that we, <clears throat> with this approach, achieve uh, around 55 to 62% of dystrophin expression, which is one of the reasons why we are trying to now push the expression to get it higher. Now, the real question that we don't know, and when I say we, it's not just myself, but the entire field is, how much dystrophin do you need in order to either stabilize a patient or potentially improve a patient? We actually don't know that. But I am pretty certain to say it's, it's, it's not more than 50%. You don't need 100% for stabilization. Um, <clears throat> but do you need 20%? Do you need 15%, maybe 30%? We actually don't know that, but these ongoing clinical trials are going to help us answer that question. Thank you for that. Uh, Zaina Basiri is asking, do you plan on working on duplication with one to 17 as well? So uh, that makes quick asking like uh, all the projects that you, like Sikit's actually been working on, on this uh, medicine, like just individualized medicine, uh, how do you see that? Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, we are now entering a new stage in the education research where we are collaborating with um, actually the brother of a young man uh, who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the United States who <clears throat> is working with us on these individualized concepts. And what we are doing is the following. We are now creating a new set of mouse models. What I've shown you before with the duplication of 18 to 30 <clears throat> is a duplication of the mouse gene. In order to really develop a therapy that could translate, direct, translate directly into humans, it would be great to introduce the human dystrophin gene into a mouse and then create duplication models there. So we are not going to do the 1 to 17, but we are going to do three or four other duplications, which, however, we feel as a proof of concept will be enough that we don't have to do a mouse model for every mutation and every duplication. Um, <clears throat> but we do feel like we want to create four models at different places within the dystrophin genome with a humanized dystrophin gene. And then we feel that's the necessary proof of concept that we can then develop this hopefully for every other duplication. Wow, that's impressive. Um, a few questions, uh, Jonathan. Um, I have Becker's, so for what I understand, the current research doesn't have any treatments for my condition until some more years. Am I understanding this correctly? So I guess he's saying like he has a milder form and all, most of the therapies are trying to change more like the like uh, Duchenne, like which is more severe to a milder form, which is a Becker. So what about the patients that have just Becker? Yeah, so it's a great question, Jonathan. And I, while currently there are no gene therapy trials for Becker muscular dystrophy patients yet available, this is definitely something at least one company I know is thinking about and planning to do. And I do believe, depending on what kind of mutation you have, what I didn't speak to you about is I have a whole other small group of people who are trying to work on trying to correct deletions by restoring the entire uh, length of the dystrophin gene. So not just a shorter version. And I do, we are doing this because A, I think it will be beneficial for the Duchenne patients, but we are also doing this because I think it would be a perfect opportunity for Becca patients. But that work is a little bit early. That's why I didn't show it to you yet. Thank you. Um, it's already 3.25. I will have time for the last questions for um, Lucy, if that's okay with you, Ronnie. Uh, so Lucy's asking, it sounded like you expect more side effects with CRISPR <clears throat> therapy for deletions than for duplications. Do you uh, do to using more than one scissor type? What kind of side effects do you anticipate? And secondly, are you involved in deletions as well? Yeah, so the second portion you, I just told you about that we are doing this. So uh, let me, I'm, I'm, thank you for asking the question. I don't want to come across that this is significant. This is going to have significantly more side effects if you use two versus one scissor. Overall, from all the studies we have done 
and all these other other laboratories in the world, some of whom I showed whom I showed you earlier, I can tell you that at least from the animal studies and the patient cell studies, this seems to be a very low risk therapy. And the side effects we are talking about. So the question is, what happens if one or two of the scissors are not cutting where they're supposed to cut, but somewhere else? Maybe in a gene that uh, <clears throat> increases your risk for cancer or so. That's why we are so careful in trying to make sure that the scissors we are trying to use are not going to do that. So <clears throat> I think the biggest side effects from this therapy will still come from the AV9 or the viruses. As you have heard, some of these clinical trials, patients have side effects. They're all manageable. They're all manageable. But I... I think these are still where more of the side effects are coming from. And we are learning a lot about this. And we are learning also a lot about how to deal with these side effects from AV9s and so on when you do gene therapy. So I, I, I know that research in Duchenne for parents and families can never be fast enough. So I'm not gonna ask you ever please be patient because you don't have time to be patient. But I do want to say one thing to you. I've been in the field now for 18 years and I wouldn't say it to you if I don't mean it. I don't think that the time has ever been as bright as it is right now. I think we are currently ha having clinical trials and treatments at hand that are over time going to change the trajectory of this disease even more so. So the question about the time frame of the clinical trial, I don't know, probably another two years at least, if not three. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, and thank you so much for your talk. It was amazing as always. I have a lot of questions where probably I'll grab you in the hospital and please everybody like- uh, Let's have coffee. Just to let you guys know, I don't think I've seen Hernan in person for the last 18 months. So it's about time. It's true. It's true. We need to. We need to catch up. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we'll have this. Uh, if I, Rick, just tell me. We'll start in a minute. Also with a new. Um, a new. Um, yes, a new we can. Program. We can move. Uh, we can move to the next speaker uh, uh, now. Hernan, thank you. Hey, great. So I'm uh, more than glad to introduce um, Ryan Mitchell, who is the Director of Business Development of, for Atzatelos Bioscience. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have Ryan here. Uh, and I hope to hear what you have been developing until now, what you have to tell us. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Hernan. Okay. So hopefully I've got the main slide up there for you and you can hear me well. So my name okay. is Ryan Mitchell and I'm the Director of Business Development for Satellos Bioscience. So first of all, I would just like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to speak with all of you today. And of course, I wanna say a special thanks to each of you for participating in this incredibly important event. So my goal for the day is to give you a brief introduction to Satellos and how we are approaching the development of what we believe to be a very unique and potentially transformative treatment for Duchenne. Now, before I begin, I do need to flash a couple of legal slides and disclaimers. And I'll also mention that Satellos is a publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Series under the ticker MSCL. Okay, so by way of overview, Satellos is based on groundbreaking science and, and truly revolutionary discoveries surrounding muscle regeneration, including the discovery of a previously unknown cause behind muscle loss in Duchenne, which we believe has put us on the path to developing potentially life-changing drugs to treat degenerative muscle disease. Satellos was founded by Dr. Michael Rudnicki, who I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, uh, which really gives us access to a world thought leader in muscle stem cell science in order to guide our innovative approach. 
And importantly, our approach has already received support from two leaders in the Duchenne advocacy community, including Canada's very own, Jesse's Journey, as well as Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. And these are two relationships that we certainly wear as badges of honor. And so we consider the combination of these elements to have positioned us very well for success. So before I give a talk on Satellos, I always try to give a little bit of background on Dr. Rudnicki, as he is absolutely the single most important catalyst for the work that we're doing at Satellos. Uh, Dr. Rudnicki is one of our country's most respected biological scientists and an absolute authority and world thought leader in muscle stem cell science. He's a member of the Order of Canada, a fellow of both the Royal Society in the UK and Canada. He's a tier one research chair. He held the maximum tenure as a Howard Hughes International Scholar. He's had over 200 publications, but more importantly, he's accrued over 44,000 citations, positioning him with an impressive age factor of 96, which is a very nerdy way of saying that a lot of other scientists have cited a great deal of his work a large number of times. But for today's discussion, the most important element to take away from this slide is that Dr. Rudnicki is effectively the father of muscle stem cells. Uh, he was the first to discover them and describe them in detail. And in fact, Dr. Rudnicki spent the last 20 years of his career understanding precisely how muscle stem cells function and contribute to muscle regeneration. And in doing so, he was also the first to discover that the shin is also a disease of the muscle stem cell. As well, he's found a potential way forward to develop a treatment to address what we believe is a major underlying cause for the progressive muscle loss that's seen in these boys. So before I get too deep into the approach, I wanna talk a little bit about muscle stem cells. So muscle stem cells live deep inside of our muscles. We all have them and they have one job to repair and regenerate muscle. And they do this in response to triggers, triggers like growth. As we grow, we need to produce more muscle or injury. If we damage our muscles, stem cells are responsible for repairing that damage. And these injuries could be both accidental from a slip, trip or fall, or even on purpose, such as when we go to the gym and we work out our muscles very hard. It's stem cells that respond to these signals and help grow and repair muscle. Now, how they do that is by dividing. And when they divide, they produce more stem cells, as well as a very special cell called a muscle cell progenitor. And it's these muscle cell progenitors that go on to behave as almost little factories to repair damaged muscle and even make new muscle. So they are the key. Now for Dr. Rudnicki, in studying muscle stem cell biology for a great number of years in both healthy and disease contexts, he discovered that it's this very process of stem cell driven regeneration and repair that is not functioning properly in Duchenne. So when a Duchenne stem cell receives a trigger to divide, it produces too many stem cells and not enough of the muscle cell progenitors. And so you'll remember that it's the muscle cell progenitors job to repair and create new tissue. And so without those green cells, the muscle cell progenitors, we find that regeneration is greatly impaired in Duchenne. So this is the problem that Satellos is focused on. We are striving to develop an oral drug, a pill, that would target the stem cell that already resides inside of boys with Duchenne in order to try and rescue the production of progenitor cells so that the progenitor can go on to perform its job and repair and regenerate the damaged muscle that we see in these boys. Now, when we think of this in the context of all of the other promising approaches being developed to treat Duchenne, our approach is quite unique in that we are currently the only group attempting to directly target the muscle stem cell in order to restore regeneration. But it is also possible that our approach could be complementary or even perhaps synergistic with other treatment modalities that are more focused on treating the existing muscle. 
So we've talked about the idea in theory, and now I just wanna quickly show you what this looks like in practice. And to do that, I'll bring you through some data that demonstrates how we've been able to restore progenitor production in a mouse model of DMD, one that Ronnie had just mentioned, the MDX mouse. So you've seen this cartoon on the left, and what it tries to exemplify is the lack of these muscle cell progenitors, the, the green cells in this figure, that are formed in DMD muscle. And in this case, we're talking about an MDX mouse. And so this is exactly what we see when we actually look in the muscles of these mice, as well as from the literature in Duchenne patients. And so when you look at the graph in the center, what we're actually doing here is counting the number of stem cells or muscle cell progenitors, in this case, in the diaphragm of an MDX mouse. And so what you can see is that there are many more stem cells than there are the green muscle cell progenitors. However, after we treat these mice with one of our tool compounds that Citellos has developed, we can see a rescue or a restoration of the muscle cell progenitors. And now if we look at the bars on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that the green bar or the muscle cell progenitors is greatly restored or enhanced versus the original mouse. Now, importantly, when we restore progenitor production in these mice, we see great improvements in muscle quality in the form of larger muscle fibers, reduced fibrosis, as well as muscle strength and overall activity of the MDX mouse as read out by running on a running wheel, faster, longer, with fewer periods of rest. So by simply restoring the ability of Duchenne muscle to repair itself, even without correcting dystrophin, we can greatly improve the mobility and function in these mice. So spurred on by these very positive findings, we as a company now are concentrating our efforts on developing this unique approach to regenerative medicine. And we hope to be bringing our molecules into pre-IND testing in the second half of 2022, with the ultimate goal of initiating clinical studies, if all goes well, in 2023. So I will wrap up here and I'll leave you with some of our key messages and I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll actually have a questions at the end after the two speaker presentation, if sure. uh, that's okay. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, so now we are going to hear our uh, third speaker actually. Um, I'm going to introduce to Dr. Joan Donovan, who is the Chief Medical Officer of, at Edgewise Therapeutic, and she's a, he's a graduate of Harvard Mus uh, Medical School and in IT. So uh, welcome, Joan, and a pleasure to have you here. And uh, please, people, if, if you want to start putting some questions on the chat, I will actually keep a, a record of them, and I'll put uh, questions at the, at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to speak with you today. And I'm going to share my screen and uh, my slides here. There we go. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna talk to you today about EDGE 5506, uh, which is a novel small molecule that is designed to protect dystrophic muscle. Edgewise is based in Colorado. It is also a public company. So I need to say that I'm presenting things that will um, have projections about uh, events in the future. So I need to show uh, this slide. And Edge 5506 is an investigational drug and isn't approved in any territory yet. Now, in dystrophic muscle, basically everyday use triggers the damage that ultimately leads to loss of function. You heard before, it's the first few years, um, the boys are, are okay in, with uh, Duchenne. But when dystrophin is deficient uh, in Becker or absent in Duchenne, the stress of everyday use of muscles triggers the damage that leads to loss. And this shows a uh, diagram of the fibers in muscle. 
And they're made up of a protein called myosin. That's really the engine that causes muscle contraction and delivers the power to muscles to conduct everyday activities. Now there's two types of fibers, there's two types of myosin in muscles. And our muscles are a thick mixture of the fast and slow fibers, about 50-50. And what um, is known is that the fast muscle fibers are much more susceptible to damage because of the lack of distance. They are damaged early on and uh, continue to be damaged through the course of the disease. So what Edgewise has done is to take the approach to particularly protect those susceptible muscle fibers. And um, those are damaged because of the lack of dystrophin. You've heard about dystrophin protecting being a shock absorber to muscles. And basically it, uh, in, it protects them from that mechanical stress. So this investigational therapy, EDGE 5506, protects fast muscle fibers. It doesn't affect slow muscle fibers at all. And in animal models with the mice as well as the, the dogs, EDGE 5506 has protected fast muscle fibers from injury, improved overall strength of the animals, limited muscle wasting, as well as the long-term development of fibrosis, including cardiomyopathy, some effects there. So our hypothesis, what we are, are looking to show is that protecting fast fibers can prevent further muscle degeneration and slow disease progression. We have a phase one uh, clinical trial that's ongoing right now to look at the effects of EDGE 5506 on adults. And I'll tell you more about that. We were just uh, able to announce some early results from that last week. So you've heard different approaches. Uh, they're all targeted at the initial step of this, this um, preventing the damage where it begins by replacing dystrophin. Uh, and in this case, by, by being able to uh, protect muscle through limiting the uh, excess contraction that happens in the fast muscle fibers. And that then leads to prevention of these steps that ultimately lead to replacement of the muscle with fat and fibrosis. This is a uh, basically a finger muscle of a mouse uh, that you see in practice. There we go. And um, basically, these are muscles from an MDX mouse, a mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And what happens when just the, the muscle contracts is as you see it contracting, you start to see little blebs, little, little pockets of, of, that don't look right in the muscle that continue as the muscle contracts. And these presumably are actually the fast muscle fibers that are starting to be broken down. You can see it in this little wisp of muscle uh, from the mouse. And these are both muscles from MDX mice. But when the muscle has been pretreated with EDGE 5506, it prevents that damage from occurring. These muscle fibers from breaking up and, and starting to have the protein clump there. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, the, we've looked in multiple models. And one of the things that we see um, in all of them is we see that uh, CK, something you know is measured early on in the disease, goes down in a very statistically significant way. In fact, in the, the mice, it basically can go down to normal. The other is that the mice are stronger. And in this case, this is in the um, retriever model after two weeks, we see a decrease in CK. And we also see that the animals are more active. So we see the mice, they're stronger. We see the dogs, they're actually more active. They're, they are monitored with a, with a fit bark. Uh, it's basically an activity monitor for dogs. And you could see that they are, um, they are if anything, they're, they're quite a bit more active um, after the two weeks of dosing. Edge 5506. So 
based on these results, uh, what we have done is then go into, oops, here we go, let's try this again. There we go. Uh, we've gone into the clinic. And this is a stepwise process, as you, as you know, in terms of clinical trials. Uh, we've started uh, to look at this in adults, uh, unaffected with a single day of dosing, then for two weeks of dosing, going up in doses to try to basically look at the safety of the drug and how it's metabolized, how it's absorbed, how it's metabolized in the body. And we'll also look at biomarkers. The, we finished now the first two of those stages and we've started to um, enroll and to dose uh, participants with Becker muscular dystrophy. And I have to give uh, a gold star to these uh, participants who actually have come to a, uh, what's called a phase one unit and stayed in one place for two weeks so that we can very carefully um, assess them and look at these markers of uh, the drug being absorbed and the biomarkers. So that is, is where we are now. So what we have seen is so far the, that the drug has appeared to be very safe. Uh, the side effects that we have seen are brief, they're mild, um, they uh, resolve on their own. And importantly, we see concentrations both in the blood and in the muscles. We did muscle biopsies on these adults to see that the drug is getting to where it needs to be. And it's not only getting there, but it's getting there at the levels at which we saw effects in mice. So that gives us confidence moving forward. So we've identified um, doses to move forward with. We've seen effects on the muscle. We've seen that it's affecting the fast muscle fibers. It's maintaining strength. And now we're able to move on um, to patients with Becker. Um, we uh, last year were uh, granted fast track designation for EDGE 5506 by the FDA for treatment of Becker muscular dystrophy. And to our knowledge, this is the first um, drug that has been uh, granted fast track for uh, Becker. Uh, and that's signifying that it is a serious disease uh, and the drug has a, a reasonable chance of, of being able to do something positive for it. So we are completing that, the a phase one study. The results will be out later this year. Um, and uh, that will give us more information and also be um, a, a lead in for our phase two study that will begin uh, next year. So uh, we are um, uh, planning these trials. It is a once daily tablet, uh, potentially appropriate for any age, uh, any mutation. And we're planning this uh, phase two study in adults and adolescents uh, with Be Becker muscular dystrophy uh, to start the first half of, of next year. So I, I heard your question about Becker. We are trying to, to develop a drug for Becker. We are also planning a study in boys uh, with Duchenne. We expect we'll start somewhat later in the year, about the second half of the year. Because of the mechanism of action of this drug, uh, it could be potentially used uh, in other uh, muscle diseases, in limb girdle muscular dystrophy and other disorders uh, as well. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank Jesse's Journey for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, we hope to be uh, in Canada. Uh, we have, um, myself and the clinical group have experience um, with working with sites um, in Canada, and we would be delighted uh, to come back and to uh, work with some of the great experts uh, that we have. So thank you. And um, I guess we'll, we'll take questions. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's impressive talks and... Uh... And it's, it's really interesting everything you, ha like you have been doing and developing. Um, in the meantime, we wait for the questions from the audience. So, so please feel free to actually uh, put some questions there. Um, actually, there's one right now. Uh, is there any age limit with respect to the effectiveness of the drug? Uh, can you, Kali, can you refer like which to whom you are um, 
I guess I guess it's you, Juan. I will assume it's the it's the it's the last one. So yeah. Okay. I was I was moving things around. Let me just. <laughs> is there an age limit with respect to the effectiveness? I, we don't believe so. We think that this should have an effect across the age limit. I, you know, I, 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 what uh, Dr. Cohn said in terms of uh, being able to uh, prevent uh, further advancement of the disease is very important. So it's important to have a drug that is uh, effective, not just at a young age, but also at, at older ages. So we are uh, studying adults um, uh, with Becker uh, right now. Thank you. So actually, there's another question for both presenters, but I guess we can start with Ryan. Uh, are effects expect in uh, all types of muscles, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac? So for the Sotelos approach, we would uh, predominantly expect an effect in the skeletal muscle. And that's because we're acting on the resident muscle stem cell population. So as you may or may not be aware, there's been quite some controversy about whether there are satellite or stem-like cells in the heart and it, it doesn't really appear to be any. So our particular approach would be mainly focused on skeletal muscle, which we, we do think and we hope to show in the future uh, by improving skeletal muscle and reducing fibrosis and fat in that tissue, there could be some beneficial effects on cardiac afterload, but that's really something that we would have to look into in the future. John, the same questions, uh, what do you think? The, um, the types of the protein that we're looking at, myosin, are different uh, in the heart and in skeletal muscle uh, and smooth muscle. So the, the drug specifically targets skeletal muscle. That being said, we have seen some positive effects in the heart and it may be very well be, it's kind of Brian, what you spoke about, you know, is there crosstalk between the skeletal muscle? And if you have positive effects on the skeletal muscle, do you then have positive effects on the heart as well? That's something we'll be following, certainly in the clinical trials. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I, I have a question uh, for you. And I, you briefly mentioned it, which is basically you're targeting the, the stem cells or satellite cells within the muscles. However, those cells, they still have the mutation uh, so basically what you're going to do is, is have more muscle, but they still have uh, the difficulties of actually maintaining there and they may like break down. Mm -hmm. So it's a fantastic question. And we, this is something that we're always having to get into. And, and it's always a, it's a, it's a fantastic scientific story. And I, I don't want to take too long to get through it, but Suffice it to say that, you know, simply by restoring regeneration and giving the chance, uh, giving the muscle a chance to repair itself, we can preclinically see great benefits. Moreover, from the literature, we know that there have been golden retriever dog colonies entirely absent of dystrophin that seem to function entirely normal. And the hint there was that regeneration was at play. We also have human patients and paired brothers that don't have dystrophin, where one brother has you know, been lost ambulation early in life and the other brother maintains into the teenage years, both of which in the absence of dystrophin. Uh, the work of Dr. Kevin Campbell has looked at ablated the, ablating the dystrophin glycoprotein complex in mature muscle fibers versus stem cells and seen that when you only disturb dystrophin or the DGC in mature muscle fibers, you actually get a very mild muscular dystrophy. But when you delete it in the stem cell and you lose regeneration, this is when you get the full-blown manifestation. So we were thinking, and at least what our data is telling us, is that if the muscle can keep up with repairing itself, even though the muscle fibers may still be more susceptible to damage, you can still see a great benefit overall for the tissue. Now, that's not to say that acetylose therapy wouldn't be paired in the future, with something that helps to prevent damage. And so this is where we think we could play very nicely in a, in a multi-drug approach, you know, similar to cancer. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question for you, Joan. Uh, so you actually mentioning that you are actually targeting the uh, fast uh, fibers. So in general for Indushen, I mean, if you look how the weakness is distributed, it's more what we call a limb girdle dystrophy, like weakness. So it's basically these muscles, the, the paraspinal muscles. And 
And those muscles tend to have more slow fibers than actually fast. So you still have, of course, fast fibers there. So uh, like what kind of, uh, what, what do you, since you are actually targeting this, the fast fibers, how do you expect that the, the, um, it's going to affect the, the population in terms of, for example, scoliosis? Is that clear? Maybe it was too specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think it, it's a great question about how do you, uh, how does this work if there are different proportions of fast fibers? And I think that in most, in, in some muscles, we have almost exclusively fast fibers, like the, the eye muscles. Um, and some even in the leg, it, it's still up to 40% you know, or so. What we know is most of the elevations in, um, in CK, or we've looked at markers of the fast muscle versus the slow. And in injury because of exercise, in, in Duchenne, in Becker, it's all the fast muscle fiber biomarkers that are elevated. It's not the slow ones. So it does seem as though they are taking the brunt of it. And probably because of this role of dystrophin in being able to spread the mechanical stress across the muscle. So if you have a few that are going faster, they tend to take the brunt of the, of the, the injury. Um, and just to, to also comment and, and follow up with what Ryan said, yes, this is, this is going to be something that requires more than one um, a drug. I think that we are looking to you know, how do these drugs work together and starting to look at that preclinically as well. That's very important because it, it doesn't seem as though one thing is going to solve this, unfortunately. So uh, actually that leads me to a, a question that I usually get uh, in clinic in, because most of the families, they don't want to have their kids uh, or even the patients itself, they don't want to be on steroids on a long term due to the adverse effects. So uh, do you think that, um, I know you still didn't went through maybe like just having a lot of data, but the question is, do you think these medications may reduce the need of steroids down the road? Um, I guess I can, it's this question for both of you. So I can start with Ryan since you were the last answer. I mean, of course we're, we're forward thinking, right? But I mean, I, I would hope, right? I would hope that there are new innovative, you know, cocktails that come together from multiple places that can help to provide the most benefit and right. And we hoped and we hope to see synergistic combinations. And that's where I think, you know, pharmaceutical companies and physicians alike really do need to put our heads together and start thinking of, you know, how do we interlace our future products to give patients what they need and to give them the safest, you know, grouping of products for the greatest benefit. So I, I really do hope that we get to a place where, you know, taking steroids is no longer really necessary. So same question for you, Joanne. I, I would uh, very much second that. And even being able to reduce the dose certainly would be uh, an advantage. So that's something we have certainly put some thought into. Have, have you seen it in, a, in the mice? Like, have you tried in the mice model, like steroids versus non-steroids, like given the, the mice model, the steroids are eventually just to reduce. Have you seen something on the preclinical data or no? It, well, the, the preclinical studies were in animals that were not on steroids. It's, it's a bit tricky um, in terms of the, the mouse model, particularly long-term because the steroids have, have effects that are different uh, in the mice. Um, but we will be looking at adults and adolescents uh, with Becker who most often are not treated with steroids. That will give us some important information. Okay, it's four already. I don't know if someone else has a last urge uh, question, but uh, if not, I guess Rick, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much for all these talks, amazing talks. I truly appreciate it. I learn a lot personally. Um, all yours, Rick. I, thank you. I, I want to echo uh, what Hernan has said. Um, Joanne, it's so good to see you uh, and so glad that you're uh, still working in the world of Duchenne. Um, also, Ryan, thank you. A great uh, uh, first meeting here with our families. And to Dr. Cohen, uh, 
what do you say? I mean, just incredible. So a wonderful hour of information. Uh, we know uh, that some cases of the research that it is early days, uh, but uh, these are very promising and encouraging uh, presentations. So thank you all very, very, very much.